Hi, I'm Rick Dior. And today we're going to explore uh, an exercise that I do to get my playing a little more even when I'm playing straight 16th styles. So like if I'm playing samba in a straight 16th style, not the loping style, that's the authentic style. That would sound like this. But I'm talking about a more, um, let's say, American style that's a little stiffer. So. So that developed over the past 40 years or so. Uh, the original samba, like I said earlier, has a lope to it. So you might want to think of it almost like a triplet feel. Played by the hepanike, that particular rhythm. All right? But we're straightening it out here. And I have specific things that I do when I work on this. I play a lot of gigs. Sometimes we'll do sort of fusion kind of sambas and uh, you know they can range in tempo from right uh, when I started that solo there at 118 or so all the way up to I don't know you know uh, 140 that's the half note so we're in cut time so one thing I do to develop my evenness, because uh, uh, you know that's the hardest thing when you're playing these things at quicker tempos, and I do notice my students as well, when they layer things between the hands and the feet, the problem with these repetitive bass drum figures is that they become uneven and they flam between their hands and their feet. So I developed a thing that I do where I do uh, sort of an upbeat samba rhythm or backwards. So instead of doing this rhythm, I do this rhythm, which sounds exactly the same without the metronome. So I'll show you. I'll show you it with that. So that's the one we all know without any accents or anything. And here's the backwards one. So that adds a whole layer of complexity to what you're doing because those are the two middle notes as opposed to the normal rhythm we play, which are the two outer notes. And I'll put that on the screen so you can see it. So in my book, I have several exercises that I work on. And the main thing in the first part of the book, these are coordination uh, sequences. And I've done a couple of videos on these. But there's numbers, a number of pages with patterns. So the first, you know, 12 pages or so has different patterns for your hands, for your feet. So what I do is I write down the numbers of these patterns. So the first one that you heard in my little solo there was uh, a hi-hat pattern with my left hand leading, sort of open hand style play. And that came from page 13, number 26. And if we'll look at this on the screen here. And that rhythm is this. Okay, and I'm playing the accents as open hi-hat, so. And then my bass drum, and this is the pattern that we're dealing with for the whole lesson today. My bass drum is going to come from page 15. And it's going to be number 17. So if you look at that, and again, we're in 4-4 four, four instead of cut time, as I said earlier. And we're doing this particular rhythm with the hi-hat. That sounds like this. One, two, three, four. And then over that, you're going to improvise with your right hand. So, as always, we use pages uh, 7 through 9 in the first part of the book, and then in the back of the book, there's a bunch more rhythms. 
So if we just uh, looked at page seven, the first couple lines, it would work like this. One, two, three, four. Alright, so that's pretty tricky. And and then you can also do the same thing with page eight, first couple lines. One, two, three, four. So I recommend, you know, you don't have to do it that fast. I'm just trying to save some time here. That's chord note equals 118. You can go way slower. All right, when you're practicing. Just make sure you practice at many, many different tempos. So that's one sort of exercise that I like to use with this pattern. So let's talk about some others. If we put together some of these other numbers, I wrote some things down here. Uh, if we did the same bass drum patterns, for, so page 15, number 17, but then we take a foot hi-hat pattern from page 17, and so now we're just going to do the right hand on the right. So this is going to be a little more uh, coordination intensive. So if we go to page 17, like I said, and let's look at number 31. You'll see it here on the screen. All right. So that sounds like this. One, two, three, four. So I'm improvising there, but you'd want to take the same rhythms that we just used for the last pattern and play that over that figure. So you get the idea. Uh, it's basically mixing and matching these pieces. Certain ones sound better than others. So another good one is on page 16, and it's number 10, and it's sort of like a disco hi-hat pattern, and that sounds like this. One, two, three, four. So that's a good one to work on as well. Finally, we can do uh, some really difficult cross rhythm or metric things. A good example of that is on page 17, number 26 or 25. They're both the same, really. And these are in an applied 3-4 feel. So if you play three bars of this, it comes around. So if I'm doing this. So you see there, that's pretty interesting as well, because all of a sudden we're in a different meter there with the left foot. That's a lot harder than the other ones. So you see what I'm getting at, and I've done this before on my channel here where I build these particular grooves up. Now the advantages of playing this kind of upbeat or backward samba is you can, um, you're covering all the 
rhythms. So if you do a regular samba like this, uh, that's the first and the last beat of that 16th note grouping. All right, if you're thinking in 16th, if you're thinking in cut time, that would be the first eighth note and the last one in that grouping, all right? So the middle ones are the ones that I always notice that my students play uneven, uh, the middle two notes. And that's what the backwards samba is. So I'll just show you those notes. One, two. So those are variations on middle notes, the two middle notes of a 16th note grouping. And they will always tend to be uneven. Late, early, uh, not the same volume. They don't have to be the same volume. But that's the kind of thing that you need to work on and be aware of in your playing. I first noticed it years and years ago when I was doing recordings. And I'd listen back and solo my track, and it was like not even. And I didn't even realize it until I listened to it. So I started working on a lot of exercises, and this is the one that helped me the most, this backwards samba groove. So after you do those things with the coordination um, that is nonlinear, okay, with the cymbal and the hi-hat and the snare drum playing rhythms over that, the best thing to do is to start just working on stickings, okay, because those are the, of the things that are gonna mess you up. And the way I do that, is the way I do all of these things, is I'll take some rhythms and we'll go back to page seven here. And we'll start out simple by just doing 16th notes and trying to lock that in. And we'll just play a simple uh, hi-hat pattern and that same uh, backwards samba pattern. One, two, one, two. Now you can make that a little more um, batucata-ish or battery-ish, you know, by doing some rim shots. One, two, three, four. And you could do the same thing with page eight. I'll play you some of those. One, two, three, four. So those, those sound great on that page, on page eight, all right? And just do some rim shots and, you know, try to play with some feel there. The ultimate challenge, though, is to do some different stickings besides right, left, right, left, right, left. And to do that, I use paradiddles. That's the perfect sticking, two rights and a double, or I'm sorry, <laughs> right, left, right, right, and then left, right, left, left, as you all know, and I should know. So we'll try that uh, just over this particular ostinato. One, two... Ready, and... Now that is a lot more difficult than you think. So as soon as you get away from that alternating thing, everything is, you know, all bets are off. 
So that's what I suggest doing. And then what you want to do is go to maybe page seven or any rhythms. You could use syncopation or any of the other books that have rhythms in them and play paradiddles and use the rhythms that are written as accents, which is pretty tricky. And you might want to learn that just on the snare drum alone first. So we'll play that for you. One, two, three, four. That's tricky. It takes a lot of strength. But if you can do that, you can put accents anywhere and the evenness will be supreme because, you know, there's no sticking that's going to foul you up. And that's normally what fouls up evenness are stickings. When you start doing doubles with your right hand or your left hand, the bass drum will, you know, flam on you. will get in, into the wrong space. So I hope this helps. This is an advanced lesson. I know that. Uh, but these are the things that help me and help my students play better. Uh, and it's it's a, actually a kind of groove thing you can use in real life. But just to show you, sometimes I use this thing with brushes if I'm playing a solo. So uh, if we boosted it up a little, let's say 126, I'll show you a little of that. One, two, one, two. So again, a lot of different stickings, a lot of different brush techniques. Sounds great with that under it. As long as you're keeping that hi-hat going, the band will know where you're at, even though that bass drum is now on the upbeat. So I hope you enjoyed this. I'll just play a little bit for you at this tempo, and we'll see you soon. One, two, one, two. One, two, one, two.